Who killed Robert Kennedy? Journalist Theodore Chirac says it wasn't Sirhan Sirhan. At least Sirhan was not acting alone and did not shoot the fatal shot. Chirac has produced a documentary film entitled The Second Gun, pointing to a, another assassin in the Ambassador Hotel. The evidence pointing to the existence of a second gun is being cited in Sirhan's effort for a new trial. At a three-day conference on the politics of conspiracies and assassinations held in Boston the weekend of February 1, 1975, Chirac presented his film and answered questions. The conference was sponsored by the Assassination Information Bureau of Cambridge, Mass. Theodore Chirac. I'm very happy that you're going to see this film. This will probably be the last time this film will be shown, and I'll have to explain that. There's never been a film made like The Second Gun in the history of the motion picture medium, and probably in this century there never will be again. I say that with a great deal of pride, but also a debt of gratitude, uh, not only to the people who contribute voluntarily to this film and the probe, uh, experts, the lawyers, the press, uh, people who gave moral and financial support along a very difficult journey for seven years, but to my dear friend and fellow journalist uh, and companion, Gerard Alcon, a professional filmmaker, to explain what you are going to see. This is what we call a very rough work print. This is because I come out of broadcast journalism. And uh, in 1968, I was a reporter covering the 1968 presidential candidate. I was in the Ambassador Hotel. And as I explained last night, uh, I was the first witness to, lead, to reach the kitchen pantry and covered events uh, from the beginning to the end. And we had tape recorders inside the kitchen pantry. So there were obvious clues when I started uh, to create this sound documentary, and uh, which aroused my professional curiosity. And then it was like getting into a deep funnel and a tunnel and getting deeper and deeper and deeper and never able to get out of it. So after two years of, of work, I went to two people. I actually went to Jordan Bonfonde, whom I knew at Life Magazine. I went to David Smith, the Los Angeles Times, and there was a lot of rejection to get help I went to my friend Gerard Alcon, who's the chief correspondent for Europe One Broadcasting, and I said, Gerard, I want you to hear these tapes. And then he became intrigued with what I had done. And he said, Ted, you know Mark Lane, other researchers, they've done invaluable work in the John F. Kennedy. Uh, but we have the Jim Garrison situation. The books have uh, aroused a great deal of national interest, but also there is a resistance. What if we could put this on film? What if we could create an authentic, uh, real-life whodunit based on your work? Maybe we'd go for television, maybe we'd go for schools and colleges, and that's how we planted the seeds to release uh, the nucleus of this film. Of course, what happened is the project grew and grew and grew, because as I began to do the work, and got deeper into the investigation and found the irregularities and got other witnesses and inspired experts and lawyers and, and the intimidations, the death threats, the things that happened, uh, we overcame a lot of obstacles to get the film done. Uh, by an, uh, the year of Watergate, 1972, we had about three hours, which we cut down to two hours and 22 minutes, and I came into New York City with the film to try to get some moral support and some help from distributors, and I held press conferences there with the press. It was this film that Julian Schlossberg at Walter Reed had called several people and said, you've just got to see the second gun. He said, I've just seen a real-life horror show. And a lot of people were quite shocked, but they were afraid of this film. You have to realize that this was in the contents of just before uh, uh, the Judge uh, Sirica episode and Watergate when the atmosphere changed in the country. And in 1973, we did get financial help, and from National General Pictures, uh, we entered into a contractual agreement to bring the film out. Now, of course, what happened? More money was put in the film, more research, and we finished a first-class film, about 112 minutes. Uh, at that week when the film opened uh, in New York, the Middle East 
a war broke out, of course. Cox was fired, the Saturday Night Massacre. Uh, Agnew resigned. So we had theatrical feature journalism com competing with the, uh, uh, you know, the, the biggest news events of the year. And, of course, then there were a lot of pressures to suppress the film. And that is another story, which I'll tell you about. And, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, someone, uh, a gun was held to my head, and, uh, and uh, uh, someone was beaten up very severely. And we went through, uh, May Russell knows, a lot of uh, pressures to get control of our film. Finally, I'm very happy to tell you that the sophisticated, up-to-date version, including the new research of the new expert that I brought in the case, Professor Herbert MacDonald, will be finished uh, in about two weeks. I intend to bring this finished film, uh, running very tight now with new Kennedy footage, new research in its polished form, Gerard and I, to the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. These are your biggest experts in America, forensic experts, ballistics, pathologists, psychiatrists, who are going to review the film and then make re recommendations under Dr. Cyril Wecht, an authority in the John F. Kennedy assassination, and also noteworthy in the Robert Kennedy assassination, the famous pathologist out of Pittsburgh. He's going to be the chairman. And then on a, March the 11th, uh, we ask as many people uh, from Massachusetts and from all over to come to Washington, whether they come by car or, or hitchhike or plane, we want to get a, a caravan of people because we want to get a congressional investigation based uh, on some of the findings that you'll hear about in the conference this weekend, but particularly, of course, we're moving on the Robert Kennedy assassination, the abuses and justice, and the cover-up which took place by state law enforcement officials and the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Department of Justice. And so I'll answer a lot of your questions, but if later, when the film gets, if you don't get a chance to see it in Washington or Chicago, these are some of the preliminary dates, I think then they're going to move back to San Francisco, Los Angeles, as it gets back to the Bay Area, I urge you all to see the finished version. You understand that this film, of course, uh, I played it over and over and over again, and we made a lot of cuts, so it's technically it's not perfect, but for what you're interested in, the basic raw research, you'll get a, a preview uh, of the experience we had in producing the second gun. Now, just before seeing, I have looked through miles and miles of footage. I have traveled all over the country. I've seen a lot of still photographs because of the, the alleged conspirators which were involved in the tragedy of the 5th of June, 1968. One of the suspects was supposed to be a tall man with Sir Han and others, who was one of the prime motivators, and he had a pencil-styled mustache. I do have still photographs of him. Uh, and something interesting happens on this piece of footage, which Gerard and I finally located. If you will watch it, it runs very briefly, you'll see Bobby on the stage. It's in silence. I want you to watch a man who moves behind Bobby. In other words, there were... Uh, prime suspects who were positioned at exits and entrances inside the Ambassador Hotel. And they didn't know, from what we've been able to discover, which way Bobby was going to go out, whether he was going to go through the audience, whether he was going to go through the door that he came through. Ultimately, of course, he was pulled behind a curtain, and he was supposed to go downstairs, and then he was pulled to right towards his kitchen pantry. But this suspect, which meets this, the description in the book Special Unit Senator and other eyewitnesses, uh, Allegedly, there is a man, according to Pete Noyes, who's done some fine research in this. Pete Noyes is an executive producer, formerly of CBS Television, now of the American Broadcasting Television and ABC, of a man named Kyber Khan. And we're trying to get this man identified. That's why I'm trying to show it to as many people as possible, and especially people who are associated with the late senator, to see if we can identify him. Because you'll watch his eye movements, and they're not like somebody who's uh, in a state of ecstasy or happy but he's trying to signal something. At least it looks very suspicious, and you can make up uh, your minds, and then we'll run the old work print of the second gun uh, for your interest. Uh, let's see that small uh, version first, all right, Dave? And I'll be happy to take questions and answers after. The film studies the ballistics and people at the Ambassador Hotel. It all but points to a security guard with right-wing politics named Thane Eugene Césaire, who, according to some eyewitnesses, drew his gun and fired when Sirhan started shooting. Césaire denied discharging his gun. The ballistics indicate the extra bullets would have hit the ceiling. Two panels in the ceiling were mysteriously removed. 
High technology applied to the bullets indicate two guns were fired at Senator Kennedy. Theodore Chirac answers questions. Thank you very much. I'll be very happy to take any of your questions. Is the mic on? Yes. Are you saying that you think that the... Pardon me? Are you saying that you think that the uh, security guard or whatever he was was standing in back of Kennedy is the one who fired the second gun? I'm absolutely saying that Thane Eugene Caesar is a right-wing political extremist. You have only heard portions of the tape. Well, obviously the microphone is on. Can he turn the microphone on? Um, let me know when the mic goes on and I'll overproject my voice. I'm saying that Thane Eugene Caesar is a right-wing political extremist, contrary to the Houghton Report, which is the, <laughs> the mini version of the Warren Report which he, uh, Houghton issued in his book, Special Unit Senator. Um, now, uh, he was behind Senator Kennedy, and he was to the right. He did own a 22 caliber gun. We know a great deal more than has been revealed in this film and on my tapes, some of which is in very sensitive area, which I have never testified to, and I will not until Godfrey Isaac calls me to the witness stand under... Uh, consideration uh, and protection uh, of many people's lives that might be in danger. And we also are, are continuing the investigation and have uh, every year in this area with regard to that uh, other gun. Yes? Yes. What exactly is uh, Sir Han's legal status right now? Is he going to be uh, getting a trial? What can we expect in the future? Well, that is why, of course, last night there was uh, a bit of emotions uh, because for many years people wanted to open up the can of worms and the John F. Kennedy, the Martin Luther King. Uh, we have overcome a great many obstacles, and finally we have filed an extraordinary writ. By that, Attorney Godfrey Isaac, uh, the attorney that represented my probe, is now... Uh, through a great deal of uh, individual effort and goodwill, Sir Han Bashar, Sir Han's attorney. And he has filed a writ in the California State Supreme Court, a writ of Ericorum Norris, which is a Latin term meaning extraordinary writ for information that wasn't available at the time of the Sir Han trial. Also a writ of habeas corpus, a dual writ. He will ask for this uh, State Supreme Court uh, to... Uh, retry Sir Han, in other words, a second trial. And then prior to that, uh, like in the James Earl Ray case, in our probability, they will hold evidentiary hearings. At such time, important ballistics witnesses and other experts from all over America and possibly from foreign countries, with, if Mr. Isaac can get the moral and financial support necessary, he has donated his time and his legal services without compensation, and he has gone through a great deal of stress and strain on this case, at, at that time, witnesses will be called to testify to establish that the bullets do not match. And I will testify at that time of all the information which I have accumulated in almost seven years of investigation. Yes? Yeah, um, one of the things that I find fascinating in uh, comparison between the John Kennedy assassination and the Robert Kennedy assassination, the John Kennedy assassination was quite obvious that somebody had to make them take that crazy detour at the end and on the on right and the left and Mr. Jones had the source of that. The same thing applies to uh, Robert Kennedy's assassination. After he left the stage, I believe they were supposed to take a left and that someone talked to them and they took the right to make him go into the pantry. I was wondering if you knew who was responsible for the Yes, Mr. Euchre claims the chief prosecution witness, uh, his son, uh, he was threatened if he continues to talk with me and give information that his children would be killed like the children of Vietnam on the streets of Los Angeles. In November of 1972, his son was killed under mysterious circumstances on the streets of Los Angeles, and he fled back to Germany. So I'm hoping in good conscience that he will return if there's any a, a new trial. However, Mr. Euchre did testify that his orders were to take Senator Robert Kennedy downstairs to the ambassador ballroom, which is, was an overflow room with supporters for Senator Kennedy. And at the last moment, as they went through the, uh, the curtain behind stage in the ante room, uh, Caesar stepped into the right, another guard, Tom Perez, uh, to the left, and another guard, 
who also uh, owned a 22, Stanley Kowalik, uh, was in front. And then someone stopped Carl, unknown to him, and said, uh, Mr. Euclid, the other way, the other way, move to the right. And so he followed uh, uh, this fellow, and he went uh, towards the kitchen pantry. Although later there were reports by Fred Dutton, uh, the campaign manager for Bobby Kennedy, uh, Kennedy and uh, Bill Berry, his private bodyguard, that they had checked out that kitchen area and that they wanted Senator Kennedy to move uh, through the kitchen pantry as a shortcut to get to the colonial room where the working press was so Senator Kennedy could talk to the, to the, uh, to the media. However, this remains one of the mysteries of the tragedy. Uh, yes? He was employed by an independent firm operating externally, the Ace Guard Service. They had a telephone answering service in downtown Los Angeles and the San Fernando Valley, and about approximately seven guards uh, came in from the outside. They brought in, of course, their own uniforms, their own insignia, their own weapons. The man that employed Ace... Um, committed suicide in December of that year. Uh, the operations chief was William Gardner. When I got to Caesar's home, he told me that I'd never get an interview from Gardner. He laughed and said, well, we've taken care of him and he's been blackballed and the files have all been destroyed. And I don't know whether he meant that Mr. Gardner was retired uh, uh, safely or is at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean but no one has been able to get an interview from, from, uh, from Gardner, and I don't know where he is today. And, of course, Caesar has completely disappeared uh, since the Betsy Langman article in Harper's and the Lowenstein coming to the surface and the uh, inquiry from the Washington Post, the New York Times, from Stern Magazine, and many reporters that have come to visit us in the last few weeks. Of course, they can locate Caesar, and I'm going to also make it known now because I think it's in the national interest that it should be known, and I hope nothing sinister has happened, uh, but maybe this will smoke the truth out. Donald Shulman, the eyewitness, who has, was very intimidated, uh, the young news employee, and who lost jobs and suffered uh, immensely for what he saw, has vanished in the Los Angeles area. His immediate family and his friends have not seen him for some months, and I'm hoping now to release this information in the hope that he is alive and well and that he will surface. But I have spent uh, you know, many weeks trying to locate him and I failed. So I, I hope that he is somewhere in America, that he, you know, not, no harm has come to him. Yes? What happened with the Noguchi thing? Why was he fired and why was he being saved? That is one of the strangest things, episodes of this entire uh, case. Uh, Dr. Noguchi is a very reputable forensic pathologist. He's one of the foremost uh, coroners in America. The charges were bizarre. Uh, they not only dealt with the autopsy charges, but also, uh, of course, with his behavior. And his testimony was cut short at the Sirhan trial. He was not, they said the details would be too gory. He was not permitted to give an extensive explanation like in a normal murder trial. And uh, there were a lot of political pressures. Now, when he discovered the deep powder burns and the close contact wounds, many members of the DA's office, including the deputy DA, John Minor, kept putting pressure on him and said, Tom, are you sure? Because they had overwhelming evidence in the police reports and eyewitness accounts that Sirhan was well in front. In fact, I have uh, a police uh, diagram not only uh, the Associated Press, UPI, and other reputable eyewitnesses that reported their hand in front, whether they said four to five or six or seven to eight feet, but the police themselves drew their hand in front based on the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. So Dr. Noguchi's report was in conflict with the eyewitness testimony. You heard the Attorney General saying what worries him, of course, is when all the eyewitnesses are saying the same thing. Well, of course, they were all saying the same thing, that Sir Han came from 12 feet in front and he stood from four to six feet with his outstretched hand. So Noguchi uh, was really in a pickle. 
And Godfrey Isaac at that time was warned not to take the case that they'd all go down the drain, including his law practice, and it took tremendous courage on his part. He fought the authorities, and Dr. Noguchi was reinstated, and now Mr. Isaac was going to defend that autopsy and bring in Dr. Sirowak and other competent pathologists and authorities which will meet in Chicago. And at that time, Martin Weeks a approached the, the bench with the hearings and said, listen, uh, we uh, aren't going to get ahead with this because we might get into another Dallas situation. There'd be international repercussions if Isaac is permitted to defend that Odyssey report. And that was left very mysterious. So evidently, uh, a lot of people uh, were frightened of Noguchi's findings. Uh, and uh, the defense in the Sirhan case could have made a great deal of it, but Cooper and Berman and Parsons violated the, uh, the ethics of law, the canons of law, by prejudging Sirhan mentally, in other words, and stipulating to everything in that trial. So it was just a great circus, a showcase to satisfy world opinion and lock Sirhan away. Uh, yes? Mr. Sarah, will there be any opportunity in the future for you to get in contact at all with Sirhan Sirhan? Well, uh, I do know a state of mind. I have, have Ted? Yeah. I just want to point out to people, uh, so everyone can be heard, we've got a microphone. And if people want to ask questions, they can form a short line here. Sure. Dave. It just makes it a lot easier for everyone okay. to uh, hear the questions. I can tell you, I know a great deal about Sir Han, not from first hand impressions, but I've had direct communications for many years. Uh, inside the Sirhan family uh, to overcome the obstacles to get uh, uh, Godfrey Isaac is of Jewish ethnic origin he is a Democrat he's a Kennedyite to bring him into the case and that is why I feel very strongly about the things that were said last night you have to understand that the, it isn't the case of personalities that they it's these individuals that spent time to undermine Mr. Isaac, to undermine Mr. Harper, later Professor McDonald and myself, spent a great deal of energies, the fence walls, Luke McKissick, Sir Hans' attorney, uh, uh, incompetent people were involved in the case, like Roger Hansen and Kaiser, did a lot of damage. People say, well, I mean, forget what I discovered. Forget what Mr. Harper, which is unbelievable with his reputation, a man of tremendous integrity, and yet they sentenced the defendant with another gun, and this has never gone before any court until Mr. Isaac filed it last week. How did this happen? It's because, particularly, of these individuals uh, who were sabotaging this case and preventing the truth from getting to the American people and getting into a court of law and preventing even uh, uh, people uh, on a congressional level to get the truth out. Uh, however, to get back to your question, Mr. Isaac, he thought, well, when he was going to first visit Sir Han, he was going to say, well, my God, what is this, a demon or a monster? He found, and he has a very extensive criminal law practice. He's one of the most respected California attorneys. He says, Ted, I can tell you that Sir Han is one of the most brightest individuals he has ever met. Uh, he's one of the most sensitive and he is a very aware person, and that he, oh, I said, well, do you believe me that he doesn't remember anything? And he says, yes, he absolutely does believe him after many extensive interrogations and interviews that his mind is completely blocked and that he would love to be deprogrammed. So Dr. Edward Simpson, a famous psychologist, interviewed Sir Han for 20 weeks in San Quentin prison and was gaining his confidence and trust when authorities pulled Dr. Simpson off the case because Sir Hannah wanted to know how he got there, how he got the gun there, and Dr. Simpson did extensive interviews and, with him uh, as a, a medical practitioner, and he was able to give us a startling affidavit, which you will see in the new version, in the updated version of the second gun, which clearly establishes that in Dr. Simpson's medical opinion, the diaries are a forgery and do in no way uh, represent Sir Han's handwriting and are probably written by someone else, that they are foreign to the Sir Han he came to know in San Quentin prison. And of course, he was taken from that case. Uh, there is quite a bit of interest from Betsy Langman to bring in other medical practitioners to deprogram Sir Han. And I don't know whether this will come about because Godfrey has a very uphill fight first to establish that the bullets do 
don't match. You understand that there's a lot of reputations at stake. You see that Mr. Bush, the district attorney, is under tremendous pressure. He's obviously lying. We happen to know from intelligence contacts that John Mitchell at the time, our attorney general, <laughs> formerly, was in touch with Younger's office. And Younger put a lot of pressure to cover up, and they created phony grand jury charges that the evidence was tampered with. In other words, to try to discredit the challengers, and because Mr. Harper had an impeccable record and so much integrity, they weren't going to uh, let us get away with this new findings, so they had to make these false stories that someone or some individuals got to the evidence, and just like if I took my fingerprints and changed it to hers, the impossible that someone changed the individual characteristics of the bullet and the rifling angle, and of course, the additional breakthrough uh, that Professor McDonald of Corning, New York, has established clearly that those bullets are from two different manufacturers. In other words, we know that Sir Han and the alleged co-conspirators that went in the lock, stock, and barrel shop bought Omark CCI manufacturer that have two impressions or two rings, what they call cantalures on it. While the Kennedy bullet had one cantalure, which was probably federal ammunition, which you could buy it at, at uh, Sears. Now, this clearly shows up. A layman can see on these photographs, and Professor McDonald is going to discuss this among his peers at the Chicago Hyde uh, Hotel on February the 20th when we uh, view the second gun, the updated version. Yes. Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask you, what is the status of your movie? I was under the impression that uh, National General Pictures, which was owned by Warner Brothers, was supposedly distributing your movie, and also, by the way, was distributing the movie Executive Action. I know, well, I called National General Pictures in New York City trying to locate that tabloid that was that eight-page newspaper tabloid that was going around with movie executive action. And they said they're out of business. First, they wouldn't answer my letters. And finally got to them, they told me to call this Los Angeles firm, which I don't have written down here right now, and they wouldn't answer any of my questions. I was wondering if you could clear up the role of Warner Brothers National General Pictures in your film, if it is available to be shown around the country or one. Well, of course, National General is owned by a multi-millionaire company, American Insurance, and they decided to get rid of all their show business properties. And uh, that's how we got the squeeze play on us. And uh, Warner Brothers bought over a lot of uh, product from National General as they went out of business at the end of 73 and 74 in the winter. And Warner Brothers, of course, got hold of executive action. Uh, suddenly, our film disappeared. We couldn't get a lot of questions answered. And it took me a long time to find that the film was hidden, not only in this country, but in several other countries under different names, and that there was a lot of pressures that Younger definitely did not want that film out while he was running for Attorney General. Of course, he's the only Republican that got elected, returned to office. And um, I had to have some connections of my own, so I applied my own pressures. And I'm happy to report that Gerard Alcon and myself have control, legal control of that film, we put in a great deal of more creative time, research, and monies, and that international premiere, God willing, will be March the 11th in Washington, D.C., and I hope as many people uh, you know, can come down there and give us some support. And Dr. Robert Joling, the president-elect of the American Academy, said that he's willing to come and call for congressional investigation. So we will be bringing out the film, and I urge you to see it because it's you know, a finer quality than uh, this work version that you saw, and uh, it has the latest research, and it's a very interesting and exciting piece of film, which we're excited of, and we're, we're glad to get it out finally. Would we contact you personally? To well, you can contact American Films, the United California Bank Building, Mr. Ray Axelrod. He is the overall director right now. He is forming a very extensive campaign uh, to bombard the media, radio, television, interviews. Uh, he will be arranging for the new print to first to be shown at the Chicago Hyatt Regency Hotel before the members of the American Bar, the American Academy of Forensic Sciences on the 18th and 19th and 20th. That's when we'll preview it. The press will be there. And then, of course, we'll hold a formal press conference and probably bring the film in, in maybe a theater in Georgetown. And then, of course, we hope to move back to the Boston area, Philadelphia, back to San Francisco, Los Angeles, and get this wide play. But American films... I think it's 9601 Wilshire. Uh, if you want to write to them, you know, uh, about seeing the film, of course, 
the Program Corporation of America arranges for me to lecture at the different colleges and situations of that nature. However, uh, uh, I think that if we had a support of particularly young people and students and concerned citizens that came down to Washington and we you know, put on a proper protest, I think it would be helpful because I think Dr. Joling is now gathering a lot of evidence where uh, in the John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and Martin Luther King and the other tragedies where there has been misrepresentation of the forensic evidence and abuses in the sciences and also the findings of these experts and bring them before members of Congress and senators to launch a congressional investigation. Of course, and I feel, of course, the second gun can be a strong weapon. And that is what I had hoped that the Washington Post was going to do. But the Washington Co Post uh, asked to see the film, not this version, but the one that we had at National General. So I arranged in December for them to see it, the editors. And they were on the phone for an hour and a half with me, congratulating me, and said that they had the power. That only, only two newspapers in this country, the New York Times and themselves, they hoped uh, it would be them. And they would get independent ballistics experts even to corroborate Mr. Harper and Professor McDonald. And if successful, the Washington Post would take a stand on this. They came into Los Angeles. They asked me at their expense to Xerox a lot of important documents, which I had ready. Mr. Kessler, the reporter, did not see me. He was on the telephone. And he filed a story which was malicious and erroneous and said Harper discredited his own work. I immediately got in touch with Betsy Langman, Mrs. Pomerantz's niece, who was the, uh, you know, uh, behind the Harper's article. She flew to Washington. She had conferences there uh, with uh, a lot of people, and she established very clearly that that one Ron Kessler met with one Bernard Fensterwald for two hours before he made his trip uh, out to Los Angeles uh, and was given uh, a lot of uh, information uh, which was, to say the least, uh, fabricated and incorrect and on the basis of which Mr. Kessler wrote that very damaging story. And Mr. Harper has written two letters to the Washington Post demanding retractions. Yes. Yes, I was just wondering, uh, I mean, with all these people disappearing, have there been any threats made upon your life? Uh, well, uh, many of you are familiar to the extraordinary work of Penn Jones of what happened in the John F. Kennedy case. In it, I will give you a short history. Mr. Harper has uh, got, got par Parkinson's disease right now. Unfortunately, he's very ill, but he's been shot at during this case mysteriously. Uh, Betty Dreyer, a girl that was going to transcribe my tapes, uh, two men allegedly uh, matching the description of people that were constantly with Sir Han, a short and a taller man with a pencil-style mustache, broke into her home, thought my tapes were there, and choked her and cut her up and said, where are the Chirac tapes and wanted the evidence uh, from her. I told you already that Mr. Euchre's son was killed in a car accident in the streets of... Uh, Los Angeles, the main witness for the prosecution, that definitely establishes that Sir Han was in front and that he stopped them after the second shot. In the film, there's a panel of concerned citizens. One is Mr. Walt Emerson, the late Walt Emerson, who gave me a lot of moral financial support. Uh, he was intimidated. Uh, he owned a, a dress shop, a gown shop in San Fernando Valley and a restaurant. His, his store was, was shot up. He received all kind of death calls. He was uh, harassment took place by law enforcement officials, and then they, they put false charges against him. He ran for political office. He stood up. He had the moral courage to stand up with me at a time when we were under attack by the Fenster Walls and by the McKissicks and uh, by the Kaisers and other people. And uh, he died uh, allegedly of a heart seizure uh, in a courtroom and collapsed. Um, the, um, the reporter that is acting, that, is, that was best, uh, that uh, he got a good education on this case, Ken Krasny of KHJ, who worked for Baxter Ward. Baxter Ward is now county supervisor in Los Angeles County, was formerly newscaster. Uh, Bush uh, uh, arrested uh, Mr. Krasny. 
uh, the Los Angeles Police uh, Sheriff's Department did, and uh, they laid uh, ch uh, charges on him uh, uh, in involving minors and marijuana uh, and other abuses, which Ken claimed was a frame-up. In order to get out of a sentencing, he was put away for six months in a psychiatric ward, and he was as crazy as I am. And this is one of the, the sorry parts of this case. Um, but Ken, as you see, went in there very knowledgeable, and he, he really he had Bush against the wall. That's the reporter uh, who locates uh, a lot of the the abuses and the deceptions that are involved in the case. Um, there uh, has uh, been a lot of threats at Mr. Isaac's home at the beginning. The pressure was put on him and his late wife, Rowena. They'd call at all hours of the morning, crackpots and nuts, and then he changed his telephone. His private investigator, Jim Risco, changed it to a non-listed number, and the calls came in on the non-listed number. They said, your husband is at, in such and such courtroom tomorrow. He won't be coming home to your children one of these days unless you get out of the Ted Chirac case. And that's when Godfrey called me to the home and said, look, Teddy, I think you've stumbled on something too big and there's a whole blackout and Rowena uh, can't take this anymore. Uh, I pushed on and um, when Harper made the uh, decision to bring out the charges against the crime expert Woofer, uh, Godfrey and I and Rowena decided to file action against the authorities and release the Harper affidavit. So the pressure resumed, and then we got, we got Godfrey into the case, and then Luke McKissick, Sir Han's attorney, which I have proof here in Boston, uh, uh, through letters and other correspondence and other campaign, did everything to get rid of Godfrey and prevented Godfrey from going before the California State Supreme Court and making oral arguments because they had outlawed the death penalty to substantiate some of the things you've seen in the films, particularly that the defendant was sentenced with another weapon. And Rowena was quite heartbroken, and uh, she died mysteriously. Mae Russell might be able to tell you something of that in, in, in Carmel. So there have been uh, deaths and intimidations, I was telling a friend last night. Often I would get strange calls, Mr. Chirac, I understand you're interested in security, guys. This was a type of voice. Uh, you are interested in the 20th century Reformation Church, and you will meet us at 2 o'clock if you know what's good for you. There'll be a man at the end of Santa Monica Pier with a white dog. I said, well, uh, you'll meet yourself there at 2 o'clock. I wish I won't be there. Uh, I took extraordinary preca precautions uh, and uh, changed cars and changed telephone numbers through, and how this film was made, I mean, would, would make a very good book and the connections that I have on, on the inside. Uh, that is why at all times uh, I was able to know a lot of things that were happening in this case. We were getting reports, what Fenster Wall was doing, what McKissick was doing, even what Don Freed was doing when he uh, was going to make a movie and Mrs. Hanna decided to stop it, what Jack Kimber was doing, Lillian Castellano. Even as they tried to divide Mr. Harper and myself, uh, through connections and intelligence contacts, we were able to get a lot of information, always to stay at top of the case. The reason being is that I always had faith in Godfrey Isaac. It was my dream and hope that he would be the most knowledgeable, the most uh, brilliant man to take this case before the courts. And uh, through the help of very respected reporter Bill Farr of the Los Angeles Times and Hal Jackson, another newspaper man, but. Um, to my own initiative largely and finally convincing the Sirhan family we were able to bring Godfrey back in the case. And of course everything is out in the open and now and uh, we aren't afraid, you know, we're going to fight for the truth. Yes? Uh, does the evidence in, you know, that you've collected seem to indicate the involvement of any of the intelligence agencies in the United States? Yes, uh, there are a lot of threads. Uh, and the, some are stronger and some are weaker. There is the case like of Eugene Braden, uh, who uh, the work that Pete Noyes did of KABC Television, now the executive news producer, who traces Mr. Braden with connections to the right wing and CIA operatives of being in Dallas and also in the Ambassador Hotel. 
We do know, and that's what I'm hoping, that Lieut Lieutenant Manuel Pena, P-A-E-N-N-A, -N was really the brains behind the Special Unit Senator, the Houghton investigation of the LAPD. Mr. Pena did receive training in McLean, Virginia, uh, under CIA Front Group A. He, uh, uh, he, he resigned from the LAPD, supposedly went away, took this training. Aid, of course, was that operation in Latin America. Just before the assassination, he returned. Some, they were really surprised to see him there. And he was assigned to the case. Now, what was going on? Why were they using another gun? Why all this fraudulent evidence? We do know there's a criminal conspiracy section which of the Los Angeles Police Department Intelligence Unit, which is an outgrowth, outgrowth of Special Unit Senator that answers to no one. Some of, some of the Lewis Tackle uh, allegations, and of course in Chicago you've heard Mayor, Mayor Daly runs that. In Los Angeles we've heard, we've heard, we've heard and it's uh, mostly true that the LAPD runs uh, LA. Uh, we think that we need a congressional investigation uh, to find out how these police operatives and what their connections were to CIA or to CIA type operations and there were certain members uh, because allegedly there have been reports that the CIA did use local police. I wonder about the Chicago riots and I wonder about some of the irregularities and the strange circumstances that went on. Uh, uh, there are reports of, of underworld uh, uh, you, uh, uh, in, a, in a marriage, an alliance between extreme right-wing money out of Texas, uh, the, the hypnotic uh, section, you know, in which uh, uh, Sirhan and others were used uh, as pawns, and stationed at different doors. This is very complex. Uh, there's a lot of... I think the only way we're going to get at this truth is the same way as the Watergate hearings, is to subpoena all the truth. In other words, all the, there's 50,000 pieces of evidence within the LAPD, 10 illustrated volumes paid by the taxpayer. Uh, Houghton has got to talk. Younger has got to talk. Somebody's got to put the squeeze on Woofer because Captain Don Martin... Uh, who was in charge of that crime lab, he said, hey, I'm getting out of here. I've had enough of this. Evidently, man had some integrity or honesty. And Woofer was fixed to be put in, in charge there. Uh, uh, we know that these things are going on within, you know, uh, uh, the American assassination syndrome. And as I, you know, suggested yesterday and others, that if somebody, if there was a powerful organization with, with investigators and channeled all this information, uh, from all the different tragedies, we'd be shocked probably to see some substantial links, especially with, as Mark Ling suggested, with subpoena power. Uh, yes. If I receive the correct impression, after his autopsy, uh, Dr. Naguchi claimed that the, uh, the fatal shots had been fired from the rear be, uh, with it, between the distance of one and three inches. If that's, if that's true, um, where does that leave the uh, putative shots by Officer... Um, Cesar, could they have been the, the fatal wounds? And if not, where did they go? Well, you see, unlike uh, the Dallas situation, which I'm not talking about with all due respect to the researchers, the investigators, nobody's yet been able to name anybody. I mean, we see pictures and we see guns, and uh, of course, the, it's frightening in the, in the John F. Kennedy tragedy, you know, the discrepancies. And I, I really, I have a very important tape here from Dr. Cyril Weck. You know, he's really brilliant, the work he's done. However, what we're proud of is that we actually can place a gunman right to the rear and behind uh, Senator Kennedy, and that is Stain Eugene Caesar. And... Um, Staying Eugene Caesar, of course, falls to the kitchen floor as Senator Kennedy backs up. Uh, those wounds, according to Mr. Harper and other experts, have to come from a gunman in that position. They're just too close. This fatal wound, in all probability, was probably even less than an inch. They're just giving a tolerance of maybe three inches. These two are about six inches. And then there's the shoulder pad. They're all within that radius. So obviously... There had to be a gunman there. There was a man uh, that was armed, and he was in uniform, and that was Thane Eugene Caesar. Now, of course, he claims 
that he had a 38, but he told the DA after three years, first they denied that he owned a 22. It didn't come out until the 1971 ballistics investigation when I made the charges and the DA said, all right, uh, we'll admit Chirac, the others, you know, in effect are right, but it's all hogwash, he sold it in February. Uh, but this area of investigation is still going on and the infiltration of security in which we needed more investigative help and funds. And that is why, again, I brought out last night, these people that could have helped us blocked a lot of actions. And, you know, uh, in that area, although it was McKissick that did a lot of damage not to get the truth out in the courts, it was the fence to wall group that sent messages constantly to California not to pay any attention to Chirac and, you know, and Harper and to divide us and Isaac. And uh, these are some of the peculiarities of this case. With regards to the gun, it would seem, uh, obviously, we had to find out why they had created the false story that the evidence had been tampered with. In other words, to create a smokescreen as a result of the new ballistics findings, which they know is deliberate falsehood. Now, they are afraid, obviously, to fire the gun because Mr. Harper, as I say, has an impeccable record. He used to work for the Attorney General's office, the District Attorney's office. The, you know, uh, uh, he worked with United States Naval Intelligence. Uh, uh, he's a great scientist. And uh, they were caught with a dilemma. So, one wonders why they were using another gun. There were a lot of pressures behind the scenes not to fire that gun because obviously if it was fired with independent ballistics uh, experts, they would discover that those bullets do not match and their reputations are at stake in all of law enforcement in the country. And so that is where the cover-up comes in. But it may very well be that when they were trying to get their hands gun out of his hands, they smashed it, Euchre and the others in the kitchen pantry, and the police were aware that that gun couldn't be fired. And that's why they said, well, no one will know the difference. They got their hand, the one gunman, and they brought in another gun for testing. Then just like they left the, the tape on the doors in Watergate, somebody inadvertently copied down the other gun that they were using in violation of good criminalistics practices. So it's gonna be very interesting to see I have already told the district attorney, and I've sent him a telegram, I said if he has information, you know, that that gun, which he's saying, or exhibits have been tampered with, why doesn't he ind indict the individual or, in or individuals? But it's just a big lie technique, and we'll, it'll be very interesting to see when we finally do get that sir handgun fired under court order and uh, under, hopefully, independent, uh, respected ballistics uh, experts just what develops. All we know is Mr. Harper photographed those bullets and those high resolution photographs now corroborated by Pro Professor McDonald definitely confirm they do not match and the test bullets don't match. Yes. Uh, if you'll let me, I just want to point out some of the audience that you probably already know but they don't about uh, the bullet that was recovered from Robert Kennedy's head. Pardon me. If you'll let me, I want to uh, point out to the audience something that you probably know, but they don't about oh, the bullet. Go right ahead. Uh, I was talking with a ballistics person recently, and he said that whenever, like, mafia men shoot people and they don't want the bullet to be recognized, what they do is they file grooves in the head of the bullet so that when it's shot into the person, it widens, which makes it more certain to kill the person, if you know what I mean. Well... This is what the person said, and also I want to ask you a question about, do you think Don Schumann will ever show up again since he's disappeared? Well, I hope he will. I hope, God, you know, that nothing has happened to him. Uh, this is why, you know, I've made this public in the hope, because I thought with all the publicity in Harper's and Time and Newsweek, and with Isaac Fine the writ that he would, you know, contact us, and he hasn't this time. And other times he's been very fearful and very intimidated and afraid, you know, no, because he figures like he's alone out in the ocean on a lone raft and that all he received was a lot of aggravation and loss of jobs and people questioning his credibility and trying to destroy his character and he hadn't had peace of mind. And 
And maybe when all this happened again, he said, I hate, I better get, you know, maybe somebody's going to go after him. He's always been afraid for his life. Uh, I really don't know, but uh, I hope he is all right, but uh, uh, I guess we'll continue the investigation until we do locate him. He has to be available, hopefully, to testify. I was wondering, I heard Allard Lowenstein recently has challenged the you know, official version. He said that he hadn't, he hadn't believed any conspiracy theory. And I'm just wondering, three people interest me. One is Lowenstein and what brought him around to accepting the possibility of a conspiracy. And also, what's Jess Unruh's reaction and, and Tom Bradley? And does Mayor Bradley have control of the L.A. police? Any uh, kind of influence or control over Davis? I'm very glad you've asked these questions. And it gives me the first opportunity to answer, from my point of view, the honest story of Allard Lowenstein, um, uh, which is sensitive, but I guess better be said, uh, because one can take it away from him that he has done some good. After all, of course, he did uh, single-handedly get the support for Senator McCarthy. He did go to Bobby Kennedy, asked him to run, and he b did build a good image and a following. It was on that strength that in July of the 5th of 1968, I received a telephone call, several telephone calls, saying that the former congressman wanted to meet me. Uh, I hope this story does get out, and I hope it's printed, because the Boston papers have given a lot of uh, press to Lowenstein, but I think the true story ought to be told in order to establish all the facts. Uh, because we're getting to a sensitive area which has disturbed research of Betsy Langman from New York and other people. And I, I think these questions should be answered. So uh, I went to Robert Ho uh, Vaughn's home with Ellen Hibbler, an associate that worked uh, with uh, Gerard Alcon and myself. Uh, uh, Robert Vaughn, the actor, uh, he lived in the Hollywood Hills off the Laurel Canyon area. And Miss Lowenstein came in, he sat down, and he viewed this work print, which you see, uh, which was in somewhat better condition than you see now. And of course, we've been tearing in, you know, different portions apart. He had already uh, heard about the allegations of an alleged conspiracy in the second gun. He had already visited Mr. Harper, and he was quite anxious to see the film and meet me. It was obvious when the film was over that Allard Lowenstein in July of 1973 was visibly moved by what he had seen and that of the investigative work uh, which I had performed and the film probe as shown. He asked me to step into side privately into a study with actor Robert Vaughn. Robert Vaughn was a witness there. I wish I would have invited Gerard now to witness this. I'm sorry now I didn't. And the conversation, uh, he shook his hand and he congratulated me, went something like this. Uh, do you know who I am? I says, yes, I have a great deal of respect for you. I know of your, uh, what you've done uh, in the anti-war crusade and, uh, and the support you gave to Bobby Kennedy, and particularly the funds and the uh, Children's Crusade, which, of course, you single-handedly uh, organized for Senator Gene McCarthy in the 1968 presidential race. Well, what, if, he said, I am so impressed, and you deserve so much credit. What you've seen here, he said, has to get, we have to get a congressional investigation. And I am arrogant enough to tell you that we will get it. And I start to tell him of some of the difficulties. Forget that. He says, I don't want to know that. I said, well, I'm finally getting some help to get a new version of the film and, and bring it out in New York. I will help you. I will be there in New York. I will participate in press conferences. I will be there in Washington, D.C. I will get Senator Kennedy to see this film and people close to Kennedy and other a progressive congressmen and senators. You will get media support. And we were overjoyed. Of course, I related this to Girard. Uh, he had given a definite commitment to launch a congressional investigation, to participate in a press conference, to go publicly, to continue investigation. 
At my own expense and time, I sent him a lot of confidential ma material affidavits and document documentations of the investigation. I opened up a lot of doors to him. I told him about research of Lillian Castellano. I told him everything I knew. He returned to Los Angeles. He asked for a meeting with Godfrey Isaac. He was kind enough to take Gerard and I for lunch, and he went up and saw Godfrey. When I got to New York in October 1973, uh, I heard from National General that Aller Lowenstein was not going to participate uh, in any uh, support of this probe, which kind of shocked me. He did come to a screening uh, with some individuals, and then at the Warwick Hotel, I received calls from his office at a time that I needed harmony, that I was trying to, uh, we opened this film that the Middle East War broke out when, when a Cox was fired, the Saturday Night Na Massacre, and I needed all the support I got. Do not use Allard Lowenstein's name. Do not say Allard Lowenstein has fil seen this film. Allard Lowenstein wants nothing to do with this probe. I said, well, fine and dandy. Through intelligence contacts, of course, I never got the respect or courtesy when he came to Los Angeles. He came repeatedly. He went to Mayor Tom Bradley. He also went to Bush. And through other members of the media, I knew it was happening. He went to the Kennedys. Now, the reason is, I'm saying this thing, that there were three de deliberate fabrications. I did not, he did not invite me to participate in the, in the New York press conference, but I was present uh, uh, as a reporter at the Los Angeles press conference. And, of course, there were three deliberate lies there. Of course, one, that he had never been in touch with the Sirhan family. He made repeated phone calls to the Sirhan family and his aide, Marsha, and Lillian Research, uh, uh, Lillian Castellano, researcher, and others to try to get control of that case, promising funds to the Sirhans. At the press conference, he said he didn't want anything to do with the Sirhan case, that his effort was independent of that. He had made contacts to the Kennedys, and he was rejected, and he said he didn't want to go pro uh, public. But the point is, when the Betsy Langman Cockburn article came out, he made calls to Lewis At Lapland, the managing editor, and said, what do you want me to do? I'm going to get in. And he moved, he called his press conference. Of course, he didn't give any due credit to, to this probe, nor even to Betsy Langman, who had, who had gone through an excruciating experience to get this story out in a credible magazine at her own expense and time. And... Uh, he arrived in Los Angeles, uh, and we were not informed of what he was doing. Now, of course, he did contribute to the national good by getting this out because he, he, he did have a certain status. And with the, the New York Times being interested, and there were uh, newspapers from all over the country writing stories, and then, uh, then the Kessler sabotage job, and then the Newsweek, uh, he continued uh, he went on the Tom Snyder show. By that time, he was asking for meetings. I didn't tell, with Godfrey Isaac, I didn't tell Godfrey what to do and what not to do, but in good conscience, at the time, I guess Godfrey's office had decided uh, not to see him because we didn't know what the motivations were, and I was working very closely with Godfrey to prepare the writ. Suddenly, I received a call from Allard after this was the first time and all this time and it's very important, Ted, that we don't publicly, you see, get into some confrontation. I said, well, I, listen, all I'm interested in now is getting out the truth and getting support. I said, listen, I don't mind you. You know, this is what we want. This, but why should you say that you were not in touch with the Sirhan families or the Kennedys or you never intended to go? I says, uh, after all, we're trying to establish the truth here. It's not necessary to use these lies. And he says, if you are using my investigation, all I would respect is the fact, at least, that you identify uh, my work. And I said, I'm not going to say anything, uh, of course, I, I am saying now, in answer to the questions, because I think the truth should come out, because Betsy felt uh, that he was very insensitive and very callous to a lot of the original work and the effort that came about through very hard effort, and then finally, when it came into the limelight, that he, he took advantage of the situation. Uh, 
I think that that it, obviously Albert Lowenstein can do a lot of good. I believe that uh, if there was a trust fund uh, or funds were raised to concern citizens for justice, that people can contribute because these experts are going. It's going to require money for them to testify. I think that if he would form that type of group, because it isn't a matter of of trying to vindicate Sir Ham, but this is the only way to get the truth out. Uh, uh, he has continued his speaking engagements, as others have now, and I think that's what's important, is that there is a healthy dialogue among all the investigators and responsible people. But uh, had he uh, operated in a spirit of trust and confidence instead of in a vacuum for so long, I think a great deal uh, of good could have happened in the year and a half that he got involved and he was silent and you know, and working behind the scenes because the, the, behind the scenes they were just laughing at him, the DA's office, and he lost a lot of respect among the Los Angeles media. And that's, uh, you know, uh, of course Los Angeles Times uh, took an editorial policy to put him down, but that's, uh, that's not uh, unexpected because they're very close to Young or the Attorney General's office. And anybody that even advocates a second gun or an alleged conspiracy is obviously sent to Kookieville or discredited, and uh, they do a hatchet job. Uh, I am looking forward. I hope that uh, he, Alan Lowen says I was going to come to this conference. I guess when he gets back to Europe, I, I would like to mend fences, and I would certainly like to give him an introduction to Robert Joling, the president of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, who's quite interested in the American assassination syndrome and wants to get a congressional investigation and maybe Lowenstein, through uh, his aggressive energy, could, uh, t could open up channels. I think it's very important that all sincere people, even if though there have been mistakes and errors in judgment, unite at this point, unless they are, of course, deliberately out to sabotage the truth. And of course, we want to stay away from them like a plague. Yes? Yes. How has uh, press coverage of your efforts differed in the Los Angeles area and nationwide? Oh, oh, well, that would make a whole book. When we first came out, we only got the underground press, and then there was a blackout. Uh, the Los Angeles Times resisted this story for a long time. Newsweek magazine would never touch it until finally when Harper's moved. But uh, uh, Los Angeles, uh, as you see in the film, KNXT even denied uh, the showman report broadcast by their own broadcaster, Jerry Dumphy, that a guard or guards had fired back. Uh, they try to discredit Jeff Brent, that the tapes were doctored, that they were phony. Kaiser, have, being a writer uh, with some reputation, a damn good writer, uh, but uh, who decided to pervert the ethics uh, and the, uh, the principles of good journalism, responsible journalism, has been feeding lies through his connections, and Time magazine did a hatchet job on us. For a long time, uh, Dave Smith, the Los Angeles Times, until the ballistics controversy. He couldn't get this story through, and he finally did an in-depth report. Mr. Farr has tried to, for almost a year and a half, tried to do a comprehensive report, and he almost had the green light twice, and then there was resistance. Uh, there has been uh, often a suppression of the facts in this case. Even when the writ was filed, it was not handled properly. Los Angeles Times blacked out on most of the Lowenstein stories, and then, of course, they wrote an editorial putting it down, as they did during the, the, the Baxter Ward hearings. After I went to Baxter Ward and made some of my new facts available, he called hearings there uh, to determine uh, the abuses which went on in this case. And, of course, they shut him up, and the Los Angeles Times referred to that as a, you know, a gory or a, you know, uh, hearing. Um, it has not been a healthy atmosphere to, to work in. And Brady Dreyer was was attacked. That never got in the press until two days later, Baxter Ward got it on the news when he was on Channel 9. Uh, they try to discredit us, and, uh, and any time, of course, there was any uh, responsible news, it did, it did not get airplay. Uh, it, we did get better play on radio and in some of the local TV stations, but in the major respected newspaper in the West, the Los Angeles Times, until the Dave Smith story uh, was pretty badly. Of course, then Harper, then Kaiser wrote a very vicious attack against the entire investigation in a subsidiary of Time magazine, and then later, of course, in show. 
I guess David's anxious for me to wrap it up, but I'll take the last three questions. Yes. Uh, what has been the reaction of the American people to the films and the, uh, your investigations and the counterattacks by the authorities? You know, as, as well, now, of course, it begins to snowball. It's set off a chain reaction, which we are delighted. Uh, the American people, unfortunately, have not seen this film. Uh, that is why we're looking forward to the new campaign to bring it into widespread circulation distribution, starting with Washington, D.C., in March the 11th. And so as many people as you can to tell them about the second gun and seeing the film, I think it would be worthwhile because uh, I think that an educated public can make the difference. Uh, Robert Kennedy said that uh, we've got to care, each of us, you know, each time a man stands up for an ideal or strikes out against injustice, he can tear down uh, the mighty walls of oppression, send out those, those ripples which can send shock waves and uh, try to... Uh, uh, to bring about reforms and change in the system. And I think that is why I'm hoping as many people from all segments of the society, uh, young people, senior citizens, concerned citizens, lawyers, uh, professional people, working people, will see the second gun film probe. And now that we have distribution on it, uh, it'll be helpful. I have been speaking in colleges. We only had brief screening in New York and in a wrong theater in Boston. At, at the wrong time, and then the film went out of circulation, was suppressed. So hopefully, by speaking past year at colleges and campuses, and all this publicity which has resulted recently, and then this conference which is taking place uh, with the release of the film, more people will see it, and that will influence the court of public opinion, which is uh, very instrumental in this in this case as as we uh, go into the uh, into the high courts and try to get. Well, perhaps I should clarify my question. Um, I saw the presentation on the John F. Kennedy assassination uh, last year also, and um, basically, I don't know, I came away with it the same way I come away from this, very frustrated and tormented, the fact that the American people aren't really demanding the truth, and, you know, that this is so slow in coming. And basically, I wanted to know... Uh, you know, if you've encountered any other differences in sentiment in working as a researcher and working with other investigators and how this whole conspiracy uh, thing of the 60s and the 70s um, and Watergate, how each thing will have an in uh, interrelated effect on each other. You know, and do the American people really want to know or is it just going to die down well, like everyone else does? Well, I hope when we get to Washington, that's why we can show to as many congressmen and senators and members of the media and, and get support. Uh, I, uh, I do not think the invitation that I have to come before the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, which are your leading experts in law and pathology and ballistics experts and psychiatrists, would have been extended to me four years ago, three years ago, because of Watergate, because of people like Godfrey Isaac and Dr. Cyril Weck that, that wanted to bring the film to their seminars, and Professor Herbert MacDonald, who has donated generously, and Evelyn Goldstein, who is a medical legal consultant out of Philadelphia. Now people are willing, in light of Watergate, willing to accept uh, you know, new factors in this case and realize these people that are important, that there is an important document here, that there is this film probe. Uh, so as a layman, as a reporter, I'm invited to go and participate in the panel discussion and I think this is going to do a world of good because I think a great deal of press and media interest is going to flow uh, from, uh, from that uh, Chicago situation and then what we do in Washington. And if we can set off a chain reaction there, it can be like little forest fires and a mighty holocaust for the truth. Is there an interrelationship, though, between the Kennedy assassinations, King assassination, and Watergate? Are they all... Do you think that ultimately they all must be tied together somewhere, or is it just... I think uh, so, but as I say, in order for someone to pick up all those threads, we're going to need a full-scale Watergate-type uh, committee with, with top-notch investigators and have everybody testify and people subpoenaed, and then, of course, they get uh, computers and, and link all these little... You know, all of a sudden, Bremer has a diary, all of a sudden, hot... Sir Han never writes a diary, and then he finds it in the room. Now, all these things manifested, and then with contributions from researchers, investigative reporters, lawyers, uh, scientists. In other words, 
maybe, hopefully, this film can trigger the interest uh, because the film is very strong, which would activate interest in all the other cases, and we'll see where all the links are. Yes. Now, I think you mentioned Ted Kennedy before. Uh, you'd assume that, that he'd be interested in who killed his brother. Uh, do you, what do you know about his activity, his knowledge of this? Uh, what's he doing? Well, he has never seen the film probe. Uh, finally, he did send indirectly a man to see me in New Orleans to the city attorney of New Orleans, Blake Arada, uh, and I was told, all right, uh, they get letters, crackpots, they're very emotionally involved, death threats, and when these things come out, the letters increase in volume and intensity, and there is almost a curtain not to face the reality of this. I have been constantly uh, in person in communication with his office, his press secretary, and I'm still hopeful that Senator Kennedy and his top aides and members of the family will see the film privately. Uh, but the trouble was, uh, in the John F. Kennedy situation, the Jim what happened with the Jim Garrison situation, there was a lot of investigations. The Kennedys got involved privately, and it led to dead ends. And there's been a lot of fears and a lot of pressure, pressures. And uh, with ha what happened, because of the tragedies, the loss of two brothers and Chappaquiddick, the emotions are so high, it's very difficult for them to sit through anything like this and look at it objectively. But I think if we can get public pressure moving, I think that could probably turn it around. If close aides and other senators close to Senator Kennedy uh, would see our work and then, of course, give him direct reports. Although I'm sure now he is aware because of the Harper's Magazine article and the I Godfrey Isaac Grit that this is a very serious endeavor. Yeah, but you're talking about one of the most powerful uh, families in the country. Do you know about any investigation that, that his family or his people have, have done on their own? I do know that they established contacts privately with Jim Garrison to find, to ascertain what that was all about at the time. Uh, that they did send up some lawyers to look into it. I, I do know for a while Dr. Cyril Wexler, Burke Marshall, a lawyer here, I believe in the Boston area, close to the Kennedys, I got, was able to get Dr. Cyril Weck to look at the archives, and then the door was shut. Uh, I don't feel that they feel that they should be the ones directly to do it. In other words, if they would look for self-aggrandizement, that they were trying to promote, uh, promote with morbid fascination their own tragedy. And I don't think they'll spend the creative power or the money power necessary. They haven't as of yet. And I think that's why Lowenstein, I did know, go to them, and uh, I guess... Uh, they, you know, it's such a, these cases are so complex that they just will not look at it objectively. And yet, Senator Kennedy is fearful of his own life. Uh, you know, one of the factors, I understand, in, in not running and the threats that he gets. Uh, this issue has to break out nationally, and pub people have to be concerned, and then you'd be surprised how the politicians move with public opinion. Unfortunately, that's true. There are very few courageous leaders uh, yes. Well, I have uh, essentially uh, the same question, but from a little different angle. Was did Bobby believe that um, that his brother had been a victim of a conspiracy? Did he believe that that it went far beyond Oswald, or or ex do you know what was on his mind? And and because uh, it makes me think that that um, if he if he did believe that he was a victim of conspiracy. Um, then he must have been aware, or at least fairly aware, of the danger to his own life. Well, he was warned, and I think he was very fatalistic. And he did set up liaison with the Jim Garrison situation, and they weren't satisfied with the answers they were getting there. And uh, I think, again, uh, he couldn't analyze it objectively himself. They were Privately, they set up some attorneys. And they say that he did make contacts privately with Jim Garrison. And also, uh, he was warned that he was going to get it like his brother by people close to him. Dick Lubick told me this. And yet, he became fatalistic that, uh, you know, a man lives and does what he must do, and he just has to run. But it was actually foolish, because irrespective of what you and I think of the Warren Commission, the Warren Commission never even recommended Secret Service protection or you know, legal protection for candidates running for president. 
And so Bobby Kennedy did not have any proper security. He had one guard, a private man, Bill Berry, a friend of his, and two black athletes, Rafer Johnson, Roosevelt, Greer. And that was, and the whole thing was badly handled. And, uh, and how much you see, they really know, I suppose people closer to the senator would be better equipped because I'm only second or third, and I've heard, you know, a lot of different things said. They wouldn't have hired some better security for him. <clears throat> it does. It's, it's, it's really foolish and stupid and how naive and especially, all right, there was a tragedy which uh, really bent his mind of November the 2nd, 1963. But two months before Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, Martin Luther King was gunned down. There was no reason to carry on that type of campaign in that atmosphere. And Los Angeles police, of course, was very derelict. There was, Mayor Yorty had a tremendous bias against Bobby Kennedy. They, they gave a, somewhat over 100 tickets, Harrisman, to the campaign motorcade. Uh, they, it seemed like, you know, I guess it maybe it had been only half an hour, but it seemed so long before police got in the Ambassador Hotel, the way that, that, that whole thing, uh, it was just a complete lack of security and a breakdown. And I think they carry it heavy in their consciences as a matter of fact, they had a pyramid, Rayford Johnson, Roosevelt Greer, and they didn't even follow, because they're not professional men, they didn't follow that at that moment. And I guess they still can't sleep with themselves thinking about that. And one of the, the aides even had a nervous breakdown and went to the mental hospital uh, because of this tragedy uh, and, and the lack of security and the improper. And I think this weighs on Senator Kennedy, Teddy Kennedy. I think that's why I think he should see the film, <coughs> because you know, when you're aware, at least you can take some safeguards and you can do things differently. And uh, especially now when we're getting to the FBI and the CIA investigations, if there are these links and there are these operations, now's the time to root them out. Now let's not have, you know, uh, decide the next election uh, with bullets. I'll take one more question and I guess Dave would like me to ramp it up. They've been, you know, very good audience, yes. You were asked earlier the, uh, who the guy was that employed a security agency to, uh, that wound up with this guy who may have shot the guns, and you said the man that did it committed suicide that Christmas. This man that hired Ace, who was he working for? Under what authorization did he hire Ace? Was he a Kennedy man or a hotel man or what? Well, there are some reports, of course, that there was syndicate involvement in the ownership of the Ambassador Hotel. Uh, he, was, uh, he was employed by the Ambassador Hotel. It came as a surprise to me that they have stamped uh, a no-talk policy at the hotel and that files, you know, were destroyed on this case. And uh, I don't know where Mr. Gardner is, uh, but Mr. Gardner was one of the gentlemen that was in charge of security responsible for bringing Ace in from the outside. Kennedy organization? No. In fact, just to end this, Frank Mangowitz, Senator Kennedy's press secretary, Lowenstein told me this, and I found out myself. They were all surprised. That's why they were attacking my credibility when I first came to New York. Well, what the hell is Chirac talking about? You know, we know there weren't any, you know, they were surprised that there were guards there, uniformed guards. And that's what got my curiosity on this case, because I... I couldn't believe that there were uniformed guys. So why, how could an eyewitness like Shulman make something up? See, they were saying Shulman's not in the kitchen pantry. Well, how could anybody say that momentarily when I had the Jeff Brent tapes and was going over UPI and no one else was saying it because all we knew was Bill Berry, Rayford Johnson, Roosevelt Greer. So I had to either verify that uh, or, or discredit it. And then Euchre gave me the break during the trial. I went to her interview him. I said, by the way, Carl, did you see any security guards in that room? He says, by God, he said, sure there were. There was one on the left and one behind me, and, uh, and I saw one after. We apprehended Sir Han with a gun in his hand. I said, are you crazy? You could have killed me. So I became obsessed at that moment. There was something to showman, and of course later I was able to definitely establish that there were uniformed security men, and I established that this guard that Euchre saw was Jack Merritt, 
uh, another guy that was at the center embassy door that said there was going to be big trouble that night, things were going to be taken care of. He said it to Caesar, and they were laughing. And then when Caesar fell to the floor, got up with his gun, he didn't stand there to protect Senator Kennedy or the crowds around the tragedy. He ran outside, and he called Merritt to come, you know, quickly. And Merritt came dashing in with that gun. And then Bill Berry turned and said, hey, we don't need guns in here, you know, uh, we need doctors. But then Kaiser tries to say that that is Caesar, that Caesar stood around, and he didn't even know about Jack, Jack Merritt in trying, of course, to discredit my work and my probe. But I had done further research on this. Uh, uh, so I also know that you know both Caesar and, and Merritt got divorces, and C Merritt got disappeared out of the area, too. So there are a lot of mysteries to this uh, tragedy. There has been a definite uh, cover-up. There has been suppression of evidence, manufacturing evidence, and destruction of evidence. Uh, we do know uh, that Sir Han was involved with others. It's a good possibility that security was infiltrated, that this was a sophistic sophisticated plot using uh, people that are brainwashed, uh, uh, and that there is an extreme right-wing element to this uh, assassination, and that law enforcement agencies within California and domestically have participated in a monumental cover-up and have perpetrated a fraud upon the American people. And I believe that each of us, like Bobby Kennedy has said when he was Attorney General, we have to be equal to the task, we have to be e equal to our court system, and ahead of the court system in protecting our fundamental rights and getting out the truth. And I hope that many of you can, can come March the 11th, probably in Georgetown, uh, to Washington, D.C., and give us support when we bring the second gun there. And thank you very, very much. Uh, I guess you want one question. One. I'll, I'll just take you, your question then. It's I'll what to do with you just mentioned at the end about why um, they pick such vulnerable people, brainwash them, rather than, like Sir Ann, rather than taking extreme right-wing well, it's best to use individuals, uh, psychotic individuals, or people who are weak or impressionable, or something like this. When they use dupes or pawns, that's that's a natural. And you, you know, and and they, and they would use people just like they would use informers and people who can be uh, turned upside down, like you would switch a milk bottle, and uh, are pliable, and uh, can, can be pawns in a gigantic game. If there's you know, the master plotters at top and the money people and intelligence operators and those that are trained. And that, that intelligence systems do use that. Yeah, from what you said earlier, uh, you didn't feel that Sirhan was this type of man. You didn't feel that Sirhan was this type of man from what you said earlier. Well, we would have to... Uh, the impressions that I have from Godfrey Eyes, of course, that he's very intelligent and sensitive, that doesn't mean to say that he is without passion and without tremendous bias, uh, self-admitted, in you know, he, although he was educated here in the States, he came from uh, the Middle East, uh, from the Palestinian section. He has certain prejudices based on his experiences. Uh, and he, in other words, they would use somebody that could uh, look, you know, he's, he can get emotional or hysterical, or his passions could be inflamed to the point now, under hypnosis, under the, in, the influence of what I call the PDHM formula, painful experiences of his past, hypnotism, mysticism, and possibly drugs, anything can happen to a man. There are many cases, you know, in, in crime annals. In Denmark, you know, burglaries and robberies are going to bank robberies. Uh, so this is a type of, you know, even a person that could be intelligent and sensitive, but also... Uh, highly impressionable can be utilized. Of course, you get into psychological motivation and its area of psychology. It would be interesting to see what these psychiatrists say in Chicago and the peers because, as you know, Dr. Diamond and Dr. Uh, Pollock come under severe criticism that they violated medical precepts in the way that hypnotism was handled. I wish, you know, a responsible medical hypnotist could get to Sir Han for hours quietly, and I think a lot of truth could come out of that. Theodore Chirac, documentarian, producer of the film The Second Gun on the assassination of Robert Kennedy. His remarks were recorded at a three-day conference on the politics of assassinations and conspiracies 
held in Boston on February 1, 1975. The conference was sponsored by the Assassination Information Bureau. For more information, you can write to the AIB at 63 Inman Street, Cambridge, Mass., 02139. This program was produced by Pacifica Radio affiliate WBUR at Boston University.